start. Uh, first of all, welcome everyone and thank you so much for coming. Um, thank you to our panelists and, and our facilitator and AmeriCorps um, and everyone who's here to help out. Uh, I'm Angie Hilsman. Um, I'm with the Complete to Compete grant through the university and an AmeriCorps member and helped put this together. Um, you guys are at the female leaders panel discussion, obviously. Um, we're hoping to make some connections, be inspired, and uh, talk about diversifying leadership and how that happens. Um, I'm going to let Sarah do introductions in a minute, but I just wanted to point out a couple things. You guys all passed the bathrooms when you walked in, so those are over there. Um, I'm going to send any children, if you want to send your children across the hall to room four, they'll be with Juan. Juan, can you raise your hand for me? Um, Juan's an AmeriCorps and he works with students, so he is more than qualified to handle your youth, I promise. Um, there's food, help yourself. Uh, there's fidgety things if you're like a kinest, uh, I can't say it now, kinesthetic learner. Help yourself to Play-Doh or pipe cleaners. Um, I'm just going to ask everyone super respectful, which I know we all will be with the um, noise level. And if you didn't already, if you just want to sign in on your way out, that would be super helpful. It just helps us track the success of our programs. And there's post surveys too, so you can tell us if we did a great job or not. Um, so with that, I'm going to let Sarah start. And thank you, guys. Thank you all again so much. So Sarah. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Sarah Stanley, and I flew in this morning from Fairbanks, Alaska. Um, and I'm really happy to be here. And I just wanted to say that the goal for me of a panel is to uh, put together in the same room people from different perspectives, different stories, uh, different lives, and that the more we can, and right now, this is for the radio, I'm moving my hands, I'm gesturing them <laughs> like I'm throwing balls up in the air, that's a good thing. So if you're feeling like, oh wait, I, wait, was, was there a disagreement? All of that is good. So we put an S on it, um, we make things multiple, and that, maybe create some possibility. So um, I'm so glad to be here. My first question, um, and I'm gonna ask Becky to begin because Becky's used to being on the radio and we may listen to her for some tips on how to, <laughs> on how to communicate, including myself. Um, but I'd like everybody to answer this. Um, so I'm flipping the question. So imagine you're in the audience and you're listening to you. What do you wanna hear about the last five years or something in your in your uh, story wow um well i'm becky myers and i'm the gm at raven radio um i gave sarah the advice you know you can speak and you know gesticulate on the radio you just have to say what you're doing so fist up in the air <laughs> <laughs> you're doing stuff on the radio um Something that I want to tell the audience about my last five years. Um, I think that in my story, it's been critically important to have the chance to work with mentors and to be able to, um, to speak with somebody who had much more experience in my field than I and to be able to ask them questions, particularly about sort of like philosophical things. And, be able to ask the wrong questions to get feedback and to hear what other approaches might be, but never from like a judgmental place. So um, my past five years, gosh, it's 2019. So I guess that would be, you know, yeah, a long line of mentors and them giving me the chance to uh, fail creatively. So yeah, that's part of my story. I think they answered the question. Yeah, you did. Agree. And, and I think, oh, I, I do want to say this to the audience, that if, as you're listening, um, you might want to write down something that comes to you, because I really want this to be a space for you to ask questions of our experts, our panelists, our leaders. So I have a couple questions, but really it's about you. Okay. Um, so if I'm thinking of, as an audience member, what would I want to hear tonight? Um, not specific to the past five years, but I would just want to hear like, a variety of stories and, and real honesty. I feel like sometimes you can have panels and they only talk about the good stuff. Um, and I like when people are honest. So that's how I take that question. Hi, my name is Elena Peterson. Um, I guess this is tough. So if I were in the audience, what would I want to hear me say? about the past five years. 
I I think I would want to hear that um, the like sort of the things that I thought five years ago that I was able to do, or the things that I had set my sights on, felt really challenging and hard, and I wasn't sure I was going to be able to do them. And um, and in the end, the things that were the most hard about it were not the things I was worried about. Those things I was able to do, no problem. It was the things I I didn't think of that really became challenging. And so the, those are the things that I I would want to hear about. Barney, <clears throat> I'm Tracy Sylvester. Um, I agree with what Danny said that I would want to hear honesty on some of the challenges that are very real. I'm a commercial fisherman and I work for Alaska Longline Fishermen's Association. Um, so I think honesty, there, there's a lot of good with the bad. So I think um, one of the biggest things if somebody wants to get into commercial fishing and they're a woman is just that you can absolutely do it. Um, and just kind of take it one step at a time. Um, and yeah, I think some validation on the challenges would be helpful. Um, one of the things getting into commercial fishing that can be tough is some of the women that you meet will act like kind of macho towards you or, or not necessarily open the door for you. Um, and I think it's good to, to talk to each other about some of that kind of stuff. I don't think I know how to work this. Oh, you got but it. I don't, okay. <laughs> Um, hi, I'm Trish White, and I have a couple of pharmacies in town, and um, what you might want to know about the last five years of what I would want to know is maybe how the health care has changed in our country, and, and how challenging it is, and what part a person can play in that, and there's so many roles you can play, and it is um, exciting, and I have to say, as far as a field for women, it's a fabulous field for women, because there are so many roles, even just in the pharmacy field, you don't have to be, stand behind a counter, and Count poor lick and stick is what we call it. You could be in, working in a hospital, you could be working in um, at, at a university, you could be doing research, you could be specific to a disease state. So because we've gotten specialized, because things are so expensive, there actually are more opportunities for some of these fields than used to be. And there's whole new fields that exist that didn't exist a long, long time ago when I got out of school. So um, it's, it's an exciting field as far as that goes, the last five years, for sure. Does anybody want to add to their answer after listening to what other people said? Connect? I will. Partially, but I didn't introduce myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Danny Snyder. I'm a fire captain at the Sika Fire Department. Um, but the past five years for me has been hugely focused on having a child. So my son is five years old. Yeah. And the challenges <laughs> that go along with that as a working mom are um, I'm always willing to share. And the highs, the good and the bads. I think what I would like to hear is, um, now that it's not time-based or anything, um, like just affirmations on what you're doing and you know, the TLDR to all of that is you are doing it right, whatever it is, so. TL. Oh, too long, didn't read, sorry. Oh. I basically am the internet, I don't know. <laughs> sorry. That's okay, and I'm an English teacher, so maybe I was just informing. <laughs> Me not understanding. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, great. Well, um, my next, I guess, flip um, is that the verb, I'm sorry, not a verb, career is used. And so we've kind of started to talk a little bit about careers. And there's different careers on the panel. Um, and we often, working with students especially, we think about a career as you know, the end point, so you're doing your education and then you're trying to get it, you're trying to land in a career and then it's just this like bucket that you're just in <laughs> and that's your career. But actually career is also a verb and it means to turn. So I'd love to hear a story of you changing direction or turning. Um, I can start off with that. Mm -hmm. um, so I first came to Sitka as a Forest Service intern and um, I came up here as a fish biology intern to uh, go out into the Tongass in northern Baranoff Island was that summer's location. Uh, we were blowing up old logging bridges and culverts to restore watershed integrity and salmon habitat. So 
basically I was like, yeah, I'll come to Alaska and blow stuff up. That sounds fun. Um, and it was fun. From that yeah, I, I'm from Boston. I grew up in Boston. Um, and so everybody thought I was crazy to come up and do that. Um, I knew nothing about Sitka when I came. I came with just a backpack thinking I was going to be living in a tent all summer, you know, and then I got here and there's a McDonald's and everything else. Um, but in that first year, I was out in the field pretty much the whole time. Um, the first thing when I came to Sitka, the first thing that struck me was just that we have this amazing fishing fleet here. Coming from New England, we love to pretend that we're nautical, <laughs> but it's like nothing like what we have here. Um, and so I was just blown away that this still exists. And uh, I've been going to school for fisheries biology and management in Vermont. Um, so fisheries is something that I'm interested in, and when you're in school for that, you're kind of encouraged to take uh, jobs with, say, like the state or the feds. And um, but I've, as I've like gone through the past ten years, I've met a lot of other people too who maybe started out in, with the state or the feds, and then they kind of got into commercial fishing. Um, I was just down in D.C. last week and met a girl from Cape Cod who had been an observer for a long time, met fishermen, and got into it. So. Getting into commercial fishing can be tricky as a woman if you didn't grow up doing it. Um, they, they commercial fish down on Cape Cod, but I never had an opportunity to go. Um, and one of the other things that's great about Sitka is that we have like the highest rates of female ownerships in the fishery. So it's something around 13%, I think, in the whole state. Some towns have more females who own permits and IFQs than others. Which, you know, 13 is not that high, but it's higher than anywhere else. So that's great. And um, I was amazed at how uh, welcoming the commercial fishing fleet was. People are always like, oh, is it um, kind of hostile? And there's some bad incidents that can happen and have happened. Um, but overall, I've worked in a few different male dominated industries, and the commercial fishing fleet's been more welcoming and more supportive than any other. So. so would you say place influenced your turn? Yeah, Sika? I'd say Sika because I think I, I owe a lot to the women who have like been commercial fishing before me. Mm -hmm. um, they've established themselves as professionals. Mm -hmm. And I was met with a lot of male fishermen who were like, women are great, women are better. You know, I'd love to hire women. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, I owe a lot to the fact that there's women who've come up here and done that. And I think mm -hmm. there's something about Alaska that draws people who work hard. Um, so it takes a certain kind of person to live here, it takes a certain kind of woman to live here. So that, I think that's something to do with it. Anyone else have a story about turning? Welcome. Um, so I came out of college with a degree in mechanical engineering. And um, then I came here and there weren't really jobs for that. So I started working in civil engineering. Then I didn't really like doing that, so then I went back to school to be a landscape architect. But all the time I sort of didn't turn so much as veer or split <laughs> and start doing firefighting as well. So now I do two things that are definitely not what I started out doing. And um, I think part of it is play space because I think in a lot of you can do a lot of things and not be as defined. I think some people. Um, that I know down south are uh, more defined by their job. Mm -hmm. And here, it's really about what you do in any and all aspects of your life. I like that veering, mm -hmm. splitting, going in both directions. Well, I, I don't know about veering or turning. Mostly, I jump off cliffs and try lots of dramatically different things. I, I went to school for photography, um, uh, alternative process, which is absolutely outside of fine art prints, e extinct. And I realized that I wasn't able to get any sort of work from that. And so I decided to forget that and move to you know, South Korea and tried my hand at um, teaching English as a second language. And you know, that suited me for a while, but circumstances had me come back to the United States, and there I did something totally different and um, started volunteering for a community radio station. I had had experience at a different station before, but 
it was my experience at Kibu Community Radio in Portland that really kind of set the pace for my, my career as it stands today. And I, I'm really happy where I am now, but I wouldn't have known that, I, I would say even five years ago, would have just been the start of what I did. And I've gone on and done a bunch of different radio stuff, but you know, it, the path is sometimes unpredictable and you find yourself in leadership in places where perhaps you would have never thought yourself to be. And in, in industries and sectors that may not even seemingly have a leader role and find yourself being the leader. I think that that's my big takeaway from all the turns or I guess jumping off cliffs that I've done. That um, you know, a lot of it is sort of what you're willing to bring to the table and your commitment to do the work. And um, it doesn't necessarily come with credentials. That's the lesson I would say was my lesson. Although you work on those credentials, you have the, the chance to do all of that, but you know, it doesn't necessarily, you don't have to go to school specifically for a thing. And sometimes you find that your skills in school lend themselves to work and leadership in a different place. So. <coughs> Alana? I was gonna, <laughs> gonna well, <coughs> Well, I wanted, to, I wanted to ask you, maybe yeah. you have something, so I, I want to include that, but I also wanted to um, just ask also in the personal answer, maybe you have it, but also just an in interest of your um, nonprofit, the Spruce Root, and how many times these stories show up um, in terms of what you're funding. Yeah, with entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think every entrepreneur that's coming to us is usually probably starting a business or sort of on the verge of a change, and so, they're taking a big leap and they're freaked out and it feels scary. And so I think, um, and most of them are making a career change of some sort. Um, so I think it's pretty common in, in my day-to-day -day work and, and it's sort of how I've been approaching life personally as well. Um, I, I, something that I'll say about, so I've, I've always been uh, entrepreneurial, I think minded. I didn't know that for a long time. Uh, no one told me and I had to figure it out sort of over many years of questioning, like, what am I here to do? Why, I don't have skills, you know? <laughs> and then figuring out what an entrepreneur was and kind of giving myself the authority to be one and, and call myself one. Um, and and then I think, so, so that's always been steady. I don't know that that's ever shifted. Um, I've tried a lot of different jobs, but I, I don't think I've ever really moved away from that core focus of, of my career. But I will say that the, the thing that, um, that probably shifted me the most would be when I had my first daughter, so becoming a mom. Um, I think that's when I became serious about life in general. Not that I wasn't serious before, if you ask my friends, they'll be like, you were always serious, but, <laughs> but I started caring more about just the results and things that I, I was not putting care and attention to before when it comes to life. And, um, and I really thought long and hard about what kind of person I wanted to be. And I think that was the point where I shifted um, from my mindset where I had to sort of unlearn all these things that I had been taught by society as far as getting a job and, you know, getting a, making money and having a paycheck. And, um, and, so, tr and so since having a child, I've really been down this path of relearning how to be an adult and how to, you know, get to where I want to go, regardless of what is, what's right, what I'm supposed to be doing, what looks normal to people. And so I, I think that was a big shift for me and just having my daughter was um, the circumstances that, that happened. A lot of people are like, don't do this. You know, are you sure you don't have to? So it, it in and of itself was a shift for me to like say, no, I'm gonna make these decisions based on kind of what I want, not what society has taught me to think I should want. And that, I'm still unlearning all that today, but I think that's a big thing. I see a lot of entrepreneurs suffer from that as well, where they say, oh, well, I have to do th this a certain way. And well, yes, there are right ways and wrong ways to do things, but also like there's your way and it looks different for everyone. Yeah, that, you know, I, so I went to school to be a pharmacist and you kind of get in this little, categorized and this little slot and um, came back home, had been working as an intern at home 
and had an opportunity to buy a store. I met a guy who was also a pharmacist. I mean, so really, you could, we were in such a, such a routine, but there's so much more to it. And I started finding that out. Yes, kids make a big difference, that's for sure. I, that, was, that was hilarious, and I had daycare and night care. And, and then also the, the different kinds of pharmacy, because we worked at the hospital, we were um, on call 24-7, kind of still are, and I enjoy that part, and you get to know, and sick is so small, and I grew up here, so I knew the people. But um, I think what changed, and what made me start thinking like entrepreneur, was obviously owning the business, so that was a, that was a whole different thing. Sid Fry, the previous owner, took me in the back room for two hours and showed me how to do payroll, and income tax. I had never had, you know, that was not offered in pharmacy school. That was something <laughs> that you couldn't get. So that, the first thing that I did was hire somebody that knew what they were doing when we could afford it, but we, we couldn't afford that for a while. So the nighttime would be doing the books or trying to figure out how to do payroll, and that's back in the day when we had like maybe three employees in one little store. And so you learn, and as, as everything grew and our family of, of folks grew with the stores, um, we started taking on a little more responsibility in that we started to take on precept for students, for pharmacy students, and that, that showed me something I had no idea. And it was the most exciting because I had never thought that I could be like a teacher, and I learned so much more from them. So I had a mentor. She was the first woman pharmacist in Alaska. Her name was Fern Hudson, and she was fabulous. And boy, did she have a way of talking to people about their medication. And it's all, the whole thing would be a HIPAA violation now, so <laughs> it was hilarious. But she was old school, she counted in her hand, and she would go out and she'd holler out like, Mrs. Jones, your birth control pill is ready. I mean, literally there was no hidden, this was just back in the ancient days. I'm, I'm quite a bit older than the rest of the group. But to, to bring those kids in, when we started having precepting, that was, um, I think Dirk and I had been married about uh, eight or nine years, and they stayed at our house. I mean, that's they were, they were a kid of ours for the next six weeks or so. It was so much fun. I learned so much more. I felt like, oh, this is what this is what this this career is about. So that was a huge turning point for me. Um, I thought those two would be a good start to just kind of maybe making some of the esteemed um, leaders up here uh, sticky to you in the audience. So maybe you have a question. Hi, I'm Brandon Sides. I, uh, I did 20 years in the Coast Guard, most of it here in Sitka. And, um, and Tracy, it's, it's kind of specific to you, but uh, for the rest of the community too. Obviously, the Coast Guard is very, very male dominated. I got here to the Cutter Wood Rush, and of the 50 people on board or so, uh, two of them were female. They were officers, and the only reason they could be on the boat was because they had specific birthing built for them since the boat was from the 40s. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of what I experienced a lot of uh, just observing as, as a cook, so I'm always around <coughs> being a bartender. But um, I guess there's there's so much uh, aggression towards women and, and among women when it comes to like, like kind of like you were mentioning the, the hospital treatment, uh, like chip on the shoulder. Is there oh, like techniques that you use to uh, avoid having a chip on your own shoulder or to like diffuse situations like that? Yeah, well, my approach when somebody is trying to bully me is to just nip it in the bud. Like, so I was, my first fishing job I was tendering, and the skipper seemed nice on shore, but then once we got out, he was a flipper skipper, and he was just kind of crazy. Um, and he yelled at us because we were trying to tie up the boat, and he crashed into the dock and put a big dent in the start. Anyway, so it. I was really upset about it at first and gave myself like 10 minutes to calm down. And then I have kind of a go-to phrase like, um, you know, I walked up to him, he was in the middle of doing something, and I was like, when you're done with that, I just need to talk to you. <laughs> and there's something about like when you look at someone and you say, we need to talk as soon as you have a minute. It just like totally disarms them and they're like, oh, whoa, I need, what's it gonna be? And so that's worked well for me. Um, when I was working on a sailboat too, there was a couple times um, where I said that, but that isn't necessarily, like I've, I've had to say that to women too. Um, and I've been lucky with um, working for people that lift me up when they talk about me. Like I, I, one of the people that I worked for was uh, Steve Fish. 
And when he introduces me, like at this point, we have all these mutual family friends and hang out in Port Alexander. And um, when he introduces me to people, he could easily say, oh, she's Jesse's wife. But he's like, oh, she worked for me. She did a great job. And I really appreciate that. That's something that not everyone does. So I think um, part of it is just trying to focus on the positive and put yourself around those kind of people. Um, and yeah, it can be hard not to develop a little bit of a complex or, you know, there's, it's gotten easier, I think, as I've been involved longer. But now that I have the kids, I'll be, you know, on and off the boat. So sometimes there's, there'll be uh, like new younger women that I meet on the dock that they meet me and I'm not dressed like a hardcore fisherman. So they assume I'm just brand new or something. Um, like last year, a girl asked me, how many days did you fish this year? And I was like, what? I don't know. <laughs> I was like, is this a competition? And I was like, let me check my scratch board. You know, so it's, um, it's one of the things about being a fisherman in general, but especially a female fisherman, is you have to like, it seems like you have to own your own boat and have a solo operation to get all the respect that you deserve. A friend of mine just sold her boat over the weekend and now she's like, who am I? Um, so part of it is just kind of knowing that you're gonna run into it and, um, and not letting it bother you and connecting with other people who are in similar situations. Like I know lots of female fishermen who, you know, maybe they grew up doing it, they don't anymore, they used to run their own boat, now they run it with their partner. Um, and they run into all the same kind of issues, so I think it's um, mostly just important to be not too offended when somebody says something. But it's it's if it's if it's truly offensive or you're truly in a bad situation, being confronted by somebody who's trying to bully you, I think the best thing is to confront it right away because it gets bad if you let it go and then it just builds up and keeps happening. Um, Tracy, yeah. thank you for that strategy. And I'm wondering if there are other strategies that people have um, when sexism comes up in your life, or as you said, um, another response is lifting up. So like little go-to phrases you have to affirm mm -hmm. um, people. I would love to hear from you. <laughs> um, you know, living in Sitka, it's good to get out to get education and, and networking and all that kind of stuff in whatever field you're interested in. But in pharmacy, we have to get continuing education credits, so we go to pharmacy meetings. And I was actually a pharmacist for many more years than my husband was because it was his second degree. So, but at these conventions back in the 80s, we would go and everybody just assumed I was the wife tagging the lawn. And he was very good about pointing out, this is my wife, she's also a pharmacist, or saying that at first even before we, inter before we introduced anybody, because it's amazing. You know, and you don't get that near as much anymore. Back in 1985 or 86, it was that time when the actual number of women in pharmacy school surpassed the number of men in pharmacy school. I was before that time, but that, that was, that's, that's made a big change in that particular issue, but you, 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 know, you still run into it. Mm -hmm. So I hear like direct, direct um, space for discussion of, of what happened or the miscommunication, the misunderstanding to get sorted out. And then um, Trish, I hear to kind of establish some of the foundation of a first interaction. Right, and it's nice when you're with somebody that you, that helps you make sure that happens too, yeah. because it's not, it doesn't come that easy to me, like right. tap them on the shoulder. I'm a pharmacist. I know, I know, so I've gotten better, but yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's not, it's not an issue so much anymore either. I'd like to add, um, you know, I definitely try to interrupt what's happening with questions about what they mean. So, like, if, if there's something about, you know, like, if they say something that, like, sounds kind of sexist or, or even in different ways that people experience oppression and you're a part of that conversation, however you might be, it's good to act like, hey, you said that, what does that actually mean? And I think the process of working through it sometimes is a way to call people in to you know, have the opportunity to learn at least a little bit through talking it out what, what is wrong with what they say. Um, you know, when it comes to aggression um, in radio, in commercial radio, it is a male-dominated field. There are only 21% of women who are in managerial positions all throughout radio, and the majority of them are in public radio. So that in radio, it's definitely you know sort of a male-dominated field, and I find that 
you know, um, what I experience the most is sort of like explaining, you know, like, well, this is like the difference between this and that, and like, do you, are you sure that's the piece of equipment you're interested in? And and it's um, you know kind of gratifying to say, yeah, actually I do, and um, you know be able to interrupt that behavior and be assertive, which. You know, I've been reading this awesome book, Radical Candor, recently, and one of the things about it is um, not mean, but clear. Like, as a leader, approaching issues with some amount of, um, you know, like, uh, kindness and empathy, but knowing, like, this is clear, and this helps people to, like, set direction and to know where they're going, especially when it comes to their interactions with you. So that's something that I keep in mind as well. And everybody's got their implicit bias. You know, we've been raised in a society that like teaches us all sorts of ways to be down on ourselves, no matter what our like actual behavior, what our personalities are, what our backgrounds are. And it's important to know that everyone is carrying that to some greater or lesser extent. And that helps me to approach things with a little more empathy than I might have, because I definitely was aggressive back when I was younger, definitely. But I know that that's not the way to have a healthy conversation. And I've learned that over the time I've been a leader. Just thinking about like radio equipment and boats. Just, yeah, it's so funny that like that's been assigned something. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's weird. Um, well, I just want to jump in a little bit because you're far more empathetic than I am. <laughs> oh yeah, let's, I'm throwing the balls up. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I just, um, I would say in the fire service, you can get some very aggressive um, men and women, and um, it's a, lot, a little bit easier to maybe not be so empathetic back and be like, you know, I end up sometimes trying to make someone feel dumb. If they're trying to belittle me, I don't really want to take it. Um, I try really hard not to get too defensive, but I had someone ask me, or no, they just said, you're pretty good at this for a girl. Oh, wow. I'm like, what exactly do you mean by that? Because <laughs> that sounds really silly, you know, and oh, you know, okay, now let's move on. Um, but I, I do know, you know, we talked about some of like women being aggressive and sort of like not wanting to give up their space because um, um, they worked really hard to sort of establish themselves in, in a male dominated space. And uh, I've definitely seen that um, more in sort of like the women firefighters that are like 10 to 15 years older than me. Um, and I definitely was put off by it when, in my younger years, but what I realized is that. Um, that's a result of survival strategies. And they've had to build up a lot of walls and a lot of um, tactics to keep themselves safe, to keep their mental health safe, to keep their reputation safe. And they have worked really hard for that space. And, and it's good to give them the time to realize that you're not a threat. Um, because then they're actually really grateful that you want to hear what they have to say. Um, I'll just add two things that, so I think I've been in a lot of different situations where um, either I'm in a very machismo society where I'm literally walking down the street and I have to deal with cat calls. So that's one sort of situation. But then there's a situation where you're, you know, in a conference room with mostly men and, you know, the, you, you can sort of pick up on subtle or not so subtle, like, things about the fact that you're a woman and, and how that makes you different. Well, the things that have worked for me in those different situations is almost always trying to like step what I like what we say onto the balcony and look at the, the in the moment because usually when a man especially is you know treating you or saying something to you in a certain way as a woman it can feel so personal and about you but really it's not it's about them and it says more about them right like so being able to step up on the balcony and not take it personal is an important first step <laughs> and then to follow that with like stinks sticking to your ground and I think in a lot of situations I've been in a room with men and been fighting with a man like my boss or someone that you know those people around me aren't willing to do that and I do and 
I personally think it's cause I, I do it because I'm a woman because I want to make sure that I'm like firm in in saying this is what how I feel and you're going to respect that regardless of my gender but also doing it in a way where you're not it's not a personal attack and, and I think what removes that for me is being able to step away and say for a second okay this is what what they just said or what they just you know demonstrated is less about me it's more about them and then approaching it and not I think often women will sort of say let me just sort of slowly quietly back away from the situation and like become invisible and I, I don't think that's never worked and, I, and I've always tried not to do that so um, sort of those two things balancing those two things to respond to those situations good question Brandon Yes. Um, this is for Trish, and it's for Fanny, and the rest of you, including the mermaids, even though I know we're going to celebrate or whatever. Uh, in this town, we have problems with alcohol, vaping, tobacco, marijuana, you know, cannabis, all that stuff. Is there any way that all of us get to get them, could get together and say no? No pot on the streets, no pot in the homes, no alcohol on the streets, no alcohol in the homes, and absolutely no vaping, no smoking around kids, no putting liquor in babies' bottles. Um, a couple weeks ago, I saw, I think it was four or five people. Um, just our boiler routines ended, or maybe one or two, I don't know. But all of them were going down the streets. Two of them were actively smoking, you know, doing the, um, the baby, I don't know the slug for the baby, the B-A-P, I-N-G. And I can, that stuff makes my throat want to close up, and I go on that you see out of the attacks. I've seen where people are smoking outside your place, and they'll brag about, oh, nobody can touch it. Well, it's you and me, yes, I can. Um, one time I was walking down the street and this older gentleman, four times I asked him to stay away from me. Four times he kept coming over. Cigar, uh, cigarettes, um, all kinds of, you know, that kind of stuff. And my body couldn't handle him, well, I ended up in hospital for a week and a half. But I threw up all over him. My body couldn't take it anymore. Every time, every time he saw me after that, all he had to do was gag him because he just remembered his father Obama. But I know that's not the way to do it. I know you can't spit on your shoes even though technically you're spitting in your face. Is there anything we can do, like Trish, can you get, you know, them, like, big signs up, get rid of the cannabis, you know, because I know it's in your store, which I love you dearly, but I hate that stuff. But I love you dearly, you know that. Um, and Danny, you and the sick of PD. I know, like, one of the guys on the fire department goes, well, you know, um, pot's not that bad. Yes, it is. It's a gateway drug. I've seen many people that have ended up in institutions because they started with that stuff, or they died. Now, I know we're in a government building, and this is a... I'd like you guys to discuss what you okay. think would be a good solution. Okay. I, mean, I'm, I was just kind of making a joke there a little bit that I feel like suddenly I was in the, on the council, um, which was nice. Yeah, but anyway. Helen, that's a, that's a super tough question. I'm um, happy to say we've seen some progress in some areas that you're talking about as far as misuse and abuse. Um, there's a lot of programs that have been started, whether from the parents of kids that have been lost to drugs and alcohol or um, SIDC has some very strong programs now. Um, some of the instances that you've been exposed to, I know exactly what you're talking about. I think what you've done is come in to, for example, come in the store and told us so that we can do something about it. Yeah, and that's, I do. That's, that's important, and keep doing that and, and, and letting people know. Some of those things, um, uh, the people have spoken on some of those other things, so there's not a lot we can do but to keep our own families safe and 
think it takes strong men and women to, to do that, and especially in, in places of, of power. You know, this isn't the assembly, but that, that is where these things do get settled and in our government and stuff. So. I see in view of my employer's door, okay, by the door, so which we're not supposed to. No. And mm -hmm. been in the reeking of it, and like if I have to go and pick up some medicine now, I have to come back later. I cannot handle it at all. Okay. Well, well, what I heard you say, Trish, that I really liked is how you affirmed Helen's voice that she's using um, and you're using right now yeah, in this yeah. platform to, to communicate through the radio and the various things. So maybe pe other people want to add to that, but I think if, if not, um, I take another question. Yes. Um, I found, having grown up in Alaska, um, that we are in a very masculine culture here, and my tendency often to fit in in a lot of male-dominated industries, remember in fisheries and um, other industries, is to default and play up my masculine side of my personality. And I hear a lot of the responses that we talk about and the ways that we deal with sexism is to amplify that side of us. And I appreciate that. It also makes me concerned that we are suppressing as a community the feminine side of, of women in this state and the importance of that femininity. And I wanted to ask all of you if you think that there's a place in this state for our feminine side and how we can foster that community with our sisters and make sure that that is safe for us to, to display and to talk about and to be vulnerable at, in, in a community space and not have fear any retribution from, from showing that. Because I certainly feel that showing that vulnerability in, in open spaces. Uh, and I don't like that that's the case. So I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts. Um, I totally get what you're saying on that because um, I, I've seen the evolution in my time in fire service. And there's actually a FEMA um, study, <coughs> sort of a guide for women firefighters, and it talks about like how you'll, to try to fit in, you'll, you'll amplify your fitting in this. You'll try to be one of the guys. You'll try to be one of the guys. And, and that's the way that it's expected you'll be. Um, and that you'll hit a point that that will no longer feel good. And I hit that point. And before I read this um, booklet, and I was like, oh, that will happen this me. I was just trying to be someone that wasn't me. And it wasn't not me, but it wasn't all of me. And, um, and I've tried really hard since then to be just me. And um, you know, I teach things the way I want to teach them, the way I want to be taught, not necessarily the way I learned it. I um, you know, come with, with ideas for training that I think sound cool, and I try them. And if they work, they work. And, um, and I try to be honest about what's going on in my life. And I have kids, and I have you know, issues that come up and I can't be there all the time um, and I get upset and you know I can't do everything um, and I try to be somewhat transparent um, I'm not a super outgoing person I'm not a talker but I try to at least put a little bit out there so people have a sense of what's going on I'd like to address this I think that's a great question and I've only been in Alaska for eight months at this point, so it's it's hard for me to see in the specific environment. But I, I know that um, typically, as I've seen it in industries and places where I've been, that it, there are a number of different things that are kind of portrayed as masculine attributes that are, are things that we as women and other people, right, that we have to kind of face and we have to, you know, sort of you know, like don't cry or be strong or all of this stuff, and and I would contend that the that is a it's just unhealthy for everybody to make that dichotomy part of their understanding of what's happening. So like being strong doesn't necessarily need to be a masculine identifier, but also emotional intelligence shouldn't be equated with femininity. Um, I'm I'm somebody that. You know, I, I'm not super outdoorsy or anything. I, I don't really know like what it really is like to be here. But you know, I I take pride in being being a feminine person, 
and identifying like deeply feminine, even though like some of my behaviors may not, you know, be in that range. And I think that um, you have to just you have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable in that way. And it comes back to that whole assertion. Like I, I'm a person who's worthy of the space, and I am a person who, no matter how I look or act, am a worthy and respectful, like respectable human being, no matter what. I also, you know, you had mentioned Danny about like trauma, especially in um, you know industries, and for women who have been in places where they've had to really fight, and that sometimes carries this like compounding PTSD in a way that we. I think are really uncomfortable taking a look at. Um, and that can cause sort of like that sort of toxic kind of reaction and, uh, you know, make it uncomfortable for us. But, you know, it, it, it's part of the long term deeper work and, you know, not to get to like, like, oh my God, the revolution. But, you know, it's our shared liberation. It spans, you know, the different identifiers that we occupy. And I think we have to be aware and be able to work within that. And coming from a place of scarcity, like, or not scarcity, but abundance rather than scarcity. Because in places where women are, you know, they, they have to fight for everything, like, you know, what can we all do as leaders to create a space where we can work together, where abundance is more like how we're approaching things and how do we work together, just in general? I think that's a complex question to answer, though. And I want to add one more thing that I thought of as you were talking is that like when I talked about you know I I felt like my leadership and my tactics changed. I also feel like they were far better received at that point. That being honest with what made sense to me was better received by my team, not just the women on my team, but the whole team in general. That's a that's such an amazing question because we talk about the culture of, of working in just a drugstore even. And the clientele that we have, the patients that we see, and um, whether or not that they're coming to a man pharmacist or a woman pharmacist, all that different dynamics makes such a big difference. And it's a challenge to, to be able to be honest and comfortable and confident at the same time sometimes. So over the years, um, and thankfully we've got some folks that have been with us for a lot of years, so they... Um, know what our expectations are and and you know as far as the culture they the idea is to make everybody feel comfortable and if you are reading the room you can ask for somebody to come help you for example there are times when we might have a new mom and we might have a male pharmacist and and he's he, this is not his fault he's just not been a new mom so I'm not saying that so you know just just to be sensitive to that but that's that's hard. I hope we I hope we can um, create more of those cultures where everybody's can be vulnerable and safe at the same time. Yeah, I think it's just really great to notice. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you're just making me think about noticing even my own responses. You know, if I'm like, oh, you look nice. Why do I why do I need a comment? Um, mm -hmm. So thanks. Oh yes. My name is Paul Bernard. I have a question about being successful a leader. Uh, it takes a lot of hard work and determination. Uh, how how did you balance this with family and uh, having spouse or children? Uh, sometimes you, it's difficult to find that balance because Aging you parents. Really spend more time <laughs> into your career and being successful. I'd like to hear your experience. I just interrupted you because I wanted to throw a ball in the air, um, not to assume that everybody, yeah, just because I, I think about that because I have elderly parents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'd have to say I, I don't have children, I don't have a partner, I do have elderly parents that um, I try to monitor and converse with often, and that takes some time. Um, but, but it's also, as a person, we should make space for ourselves you know, for our like rich internal lives and whatever we are looking to do with our time beyond the work because it is so easy to get kind of wrapped up in like 
I'm going to do all the stuff all the time and, and what our worth and value is tied to our work product, which is, you know, it's just an attribute of our society right now. But, um, I, you know, having to balance it, it takes, it takes some determination. It takes, me, like, intentionality and, um, you know, knowing that you, you might fail. And a failure might be like I worked later into the evening or whatever it happens to look like for you, but having compassion around that time too, you know. I'm writing that down. Compassion for my fail. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> um, it that it's a good question, and it does I think take a lot of really hard work to be successful at anything you want to do. So whether a man or a woman, you know. Put in that hard work, you you have to give something up. So that I think you just sort of have to accept that. Um, but I lucked out and have a spouse who really loves being sort of stay-at-home dad and um, not being you know the career person, not being the breadwinner, like letting me just go after all the things I want to do. Um, and he and he's and he's completely happy with it. Like he loves you know it's a good balance between the two of us. So I think that for me has been really important. I don't know how I could have done what I what I am doing and balanced it all in any real way if I didn't have a partner that um, complimented sort of the life that I wanted. Um, so he loves staying at home and I love working. Um, and I don't think I could be a very happy stay at home parent. So that was really important for me and I think that's something as a younger person I didn't put enough appreciation into. I sort of lucked in and fell into that. I didn't plan that way. <laughs> so anyone young out there, <laughs> it is an important decision <laughs> who you choose to be with because it does. It's important to know like what you want in life and the person that you're with or, or the people that you're around. Are they going to allow that space for you? And likewise, are you going to be able to allow the space that they need? Um, to do what they want to do. So, but you know, as I said in the beginning, there's always something you're giving up when you're working really hard, and and just accepting that and being at peace with that it took me a while. When I was an early, you know, when I was just an infant, it, it was a real struggle. Like, how am I? Like, I had to choose: am I going to be a mom or am I going to follow the career stuff? And and I'm at a place now where I know I don't have to choose. It just doesn't look like what maybe. All my other peers are doing necessarily, or what is the norm? Um, and I can talk a little bit about. I'm also thankful that I have a partner who steps up and takes does a great job taking care of the kids. And with fishing, we take the fishing with us. So basically, the approach with fishing has been to include them in everything. So um, we take them out. And so sometimes that can be really stressful. It'd be much more fun to go fishing without two little kids to be responsible for, especially one who's two. Um, so, and then I just started working for Alaska Longline Fishermen's Association in December. So that's kind of a new thing for me, how I'm juggling that with fishing and kids. Um, and that's working out well because Alpha gives me flexibility to work from home or to set up my own schedule. Um, and sick is great for it because I don't have a long commute so that's great. I can kind of piece babysitters together instead of having to worry about daycare and all that. Um, but yeah, a lot of commercial fishing people bring their kids. Um, but generally, once you have kids, mom kind of has to step down from fishing because just realistically, you need to be there for breastfeeding and everything else. And um, so that's a tough thing with commercial fishing. And then. Um, on top of that, things like, say, a troll permit, if you own it as a couple, it's in one person's name. Or even if you're sisters, it'll be in one person's name. Unless you do a bunch of paperwork, you can maybe swap it off throughout the season. But there's a few barriers like that that I, I keep wanting to start working on. Like, it'd be great if a troll permit was owned by, if it's <coughs> truly an asset of the couple, it should be that the woman can take it out alone or the man. Because if you have these, like, set up power structures where this person has to be on the boat in order for it to be legally fishing, they just kind of become the leader of the situation. Um, so I think women fishermen could be more empowered by having a little more flexibility with fishing rights within families. Um, and it's, you know, it's, just, it's tricky to think of how to really support women who fish as far as kids go. Um, 
but I think there's a lot of opportunity to fish, but then also get involved with policy and advocacy, and that's kind of the route that I've taken. I'm starting to do more of that now that I have kids. Cool. Um, it's seven o'clock. Um, we are scheduled from six to seven, but we actually have the room till eight. So I just wanted to state that in case people had to, you know, up their meter. I don't know. Do you have parking meters? No, <laughs> so you're good. <laughs> Um, and you should take food. <coughs> Did anybody want to add to that list? I was just kind of taking notes um, that balance happens through your own sense of like grace for yourself and wellness, um, as well as having support in your life in the form of like a partner that's good, and then uh, having some agency in your work environment to, to change it up. Um, is there anything you want to add? I mean, I think all of those are huge, and part of it is just speaking up for yourself and what you need, uh, because you know your work can be flexible, but sometimes you're like, well, I don't want to ask for too much, or you don't want to ask more of your spouse or your friends, um, and 90% you know, <coughs> of the time the people around you will step up if you've asked, and so just giving yourself or forcing yourself to ask. Is, is pretty key, I think. You know, um, I would love to hear this because we talk about balance more and we're more aware, and I don't think that was such a common thing back in the day, and I am so grateful because my whole family lived here. So I'm not joking when I say I went from daycare to nightcare. Sometimes if I didn't get home till 9 or 10 o'clock at night, and when you own a new business and you're just trying to get it started, Really, both Dirk and I were tied up in that. We decided when we were first married, thankfully, we had kids for quite a while, which makes for an older mom, but that's okay. So we, would, we thought we'd just put a cot in a pharmacy. Literally, why, why are we renting an apartment when we are never there? And then when kids came, I had wonderful family, a sister and mom and extended family. So that, that was pretty awesome. I don't really know how I would have done it otherwise. Really don't. So. I'm, I'm loving to, I'm, I have a lot more balance in my life now. Of course, the kids are both grown and gone, but they do come home once in a while. I have an end question, unless someone else has a question. Um, okay, there's a question. Oh, great. encouraging to see more and more women fishing and it's also encouraging to see women on the docks that are just being themselves um, just in my perception being here for over 10 years I feel like when I first came um, it was like the women I'd see on the dock were really like dressed like rough or like covered in paint or dirt or whatever and um, not dirt <laughs> <laughs> some kind of tar or something. <laughs> um, um, but now I see more women just comfortable like wearing whatever they want on the dock or you know fisher women who are out in town who are just dressed up a little not that you need to but it's just it's nice to see a little bit more acceptance of people just being themselves um, and I feel like that's been changing rapidly oh and one cool story was um, this was this kind of happened on Facebook there was a a woman in Maine, Genevieve, who started a Facebook group called Chicks Who Fish, and it's kind of a play on this. Chicks is a size class of lobster. Okay. But I, at first I was like, that's a stupid name. And, but then um, I was just kind of recommended, and we just were introduced over the internet, basically. And so I was following her page, and it was mostly New England fishing people, women. Um, and there was an article that one of my friends here in Sitka, Tella, had written about being harassed on the docks. And um, I read her, she wrote the article on her blog and then Alaska Daily News published it. So then this woman in Maine ended up reading it, but it had, she'd written it a while ago. Um, so I think I happened to know who she was talking about as far as who was giving her a hard time and all that. But the woman in Maine put, posted it on the Facebook group, which is supposed to be empowering for women, and said, this is so stupid, she just needs to toughen up because she was writing about how she felt vulnerable and like somebody had harassed her on the dock and she got back on a sailboat she was sleeping on and was like, this thing doesn't lock. 
she was staying on a friend's sailboat because her husband was bringing their trawler up a few weeks later and she had a long line job for a few weeks. So she was kind of by herself on the docks for the first time in a while, even though she grew up on the docks. Um, and so she was just talking about how she felt vulnerable even after like a lifetime of basically being a tough girl, like a cool girl, like getting along with all the guys. And um, then it just takes one drunk guy on the dock to make you feel really unsafe and targeted. And so this woman in Maine was just kind of tearing her apart, like, this is so stupid, she must be such a, such a wuss kind of thing. And uh, there was a picture of Tell, and she's a like, sweet little thing. So I think she was kind of just stereotyping her, just looking at her. Um, anyway, so then a bunch of people that did know Tell us saw this, and then they were like, no, you don't understand, you've never been to Alaska. Like, Stonington, Maine is a cute little town where you, know, you grow out to your lobster boat and go out for the day. You're not like living on your boat dealing with, you know, transient riffraff. And um, so she, uh, they ended up basically, Genevieve got some crap for, for tearing Tell apart. And then um, they ended up meeting in uh, Seattle, the expo. And they like, so they, they talked it talk to each other, got to know each other, and now it's completely changed Genevieve's whole approach on how she um, talks to other fishing women. Um, and she, she did a lot, of, a lot of great work with getting Crundons to make gear that fits women and stuff like that. So she's doing all this great work, but then it was just sort of shocking and upsetting to see her tearing another woman down like that. But then it was so beautiful to see them get together and like take a picture down by the boat together and uh, just like learn from each other. So. It's cool to see those connections happening. It's, I, my opinion is just that we <coughs> are able to overcome those kinds of uh, confrontations um, more powerfully. Like they, you know, that now they're like a great team. And so it's just cool to see them get together after being kind of at odds. Yeah, I wish I had a really specific story, but I think the thing that gives me inspiration and hope is um, I, I very much a, a nonprofit nerd. Like I love nonprofits and like the, you know, all of the stuff that kind of accompanies it. And it's heartening to see that be led by women. And I think also there's always the question of what can we do in the name of diversity and equity and inclusion that we aren't already. And what what about um, you know the way that we operate is you know just sort of imbued with oppression and the ways to keep people from being unequal. Um, I, I think it's interesting um, seeing other organizations work in a really meaningful way that isn't the window dressing of like oh yeah we're like you know including people now um, in like totally powerless sort of insignificant ways or in ways that continue to exploit them, um, but. You know, just in general, seeing like the, the work that's happening and, and that, you know, women are leading the charge in that way. Or, you know, folks that are non-binary or, tra or trans or, um, you know, um, in whatever their expression happens to be, leading the charge in this way. And I think that's exciting and heartening. Because it, I, I can't even presume to know all the answers and, you know, how much of what I'm doing that I don't even know about continues to perpetuate the problem. Having at least a space to ask questions in that way and seeing it play out in real life, that's inspiring. So I, so the two things that the question made me think of, one is, um, what I really notice now is that, you know, I've been part of the fire department for about 15 or so years and, um, at least for fire, fire, firefighters, it's not a big deal for women to join. We have women join, and it's, it just is. It's not like there's not just one, there's not, it's just not a thing. Um, and I find that really awesome. And sometimes you get in the rig and it's all women in the rig, and it's fun. But it doesn't really matter, too. Um, but I did get to go to a conference last year. It was a, a national conference for women firefighters. and. Um, there was the keynote speaker was the um, fire chief from London, and she is basically the equivalent of a rock star for any female firefighter. She um, was chief during the big, there was a huge fire on an apartment building, and um, 
It was a total fangirl moment for 200 women <laughs> firefighters. It was awesome. Everyone wanted their picture with her. Everyone was like, was like cheering for everything she said. And that was just like a beautiful moment. <laughs> Um, I think I've had some different moments over time where I've thought like, wow, this is this feels really cool and, and thinking back to what I saw for myself in my future and not really believing that it was possible, probably because I was a girl and you know there weren't a lot of examples of what I thought I wanted to be doing and to look at. And so um, so I've had moments where I'm like, Oh, this is it's happening, or I'm doing the, you know something I had always sort of been afraid that I couldn't do, and and those moments usually are you know they're sort of fleeting and it comes and goes, but um, but lately what I've been paying more attention to is when I see other people, other women specifically like having those moments, and that to me is really inspiring because then I. You know, I can witness it and then feel like I know what that feels like, and I see another person having that, and um, so that to me has been pretty significant. And then, kind of echoing what other people said, like being able to work with other women on projects. And so I, I do a lot of different things, like whether it's my day job or running my businesses. I do, I do feel a lot of camaraderie with the women that are in my life, and and I think that that. Um, that wasn't always that way for me, and I had to work hard as an adult to really foster healthier relationships with women. I think that there is a lot to be said there, um, and if I can do it, then there's hope. <laughs> and then the the last thing I'll say is there the some of the things that I'm most excited about, kind of along the lines of what you're saying, are are um, like something like the Sustainable Southeast Partnership or some of the other work projects I'm in. It's a mix of men and women, and there's not this feeling of uh, that, that it really matters, which is really great because we're focused on the work. We're all um, passionate about a mission, about getting somewhere together, and we're all working towards that, and it just feels really good. And so I, I encourage anyone to, you know, look at what you're doing in your life or work and just look at opportunities where you can foster just more camaraderie amongst people and be the change, right? I know it sounds so... Lame, but it's so true and I think a lot of times when we're in situations and it doesn't look hopeful or you feel like what the heck but you can do a lot as an individual and that's something I've learned a lot through you know my different experiences and I I think um, just you know having the courage to take a risk and like go for the thing that you know matters to you like that that inspires other people and then that inspires change and I think for me that's what's been you know hopeful Just quickly, because everybody was fabulous. Um, like I was saying about pre-gifting um, students and and how the change kind of turned out gradually in the 1980s. That there was more women in pharmacy school than there were men in pharmacy school, and to to the bulk of the kiddos that we get up from from five or six different colleges throughout the years, actually about, about as many as ten, because everybody wants to come to Alaska. And the South Dakota boys, my husband's alma mater, come dressed in full Cabela gear. And I said, okay, this is a pharmacy rotation. You do know that, right? But the, the, the future that they have ahead of them, the stuff that they're doing, we get it for this brief moment in time, and they're such dynamic, incredible young people, men and women, and they don't, they don't, have, the, they don't have the barriers. And the, it's just wonderful to see. They're, it's their inclusive and brilliant and I learned so much from them and um, like the last gal that we had was going off for a um, special pharmacy, she was doing a residency in pharmacy psychology and psych meds and the whole thing and it's so needed for mental health in this country and she was joining a consortium of a group of people and I mean the exciting stuff that's going on so that, that's inspiring and we have seen that, that change. What a great ending to end on hope. <laughs> um, the, the, the last thing, maybe if anybody has any final thoughts uh, that you want to share, gratitudes, or um, somebody that you wish was in the room that's not. Sometimes with these things, I think we have our relations, we have our, our people that are able to, to be here when you're doing something like this. So just a chance to, or to give shout outs to people in the room that you might want to embarrass. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Mom. <laughs> Sorry I didn't get you down here.
next month for me. <laughs> Hi, mom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great example of a female. Yes. We're very different, though. Yes. I will say that. <laughs> People are always like, that's your mom? <laughs> um, I'm more like my father. I want to give gratitude to all of the women who have come before me and have laid the groundwork for all of us to start having you know, this sort of conversation to meaningfully take a look at sort of the systems that need to be addressed for us to take our power. And I want to be grateful, or I am grateful for the next generation who will continue that work and take it deeper. You know, we, it, we have a lot of work to do all together. And I'm, I'm grateful for everybody who, who is a part of that process. Um, I'll say I'm grateful for the men in the room and the women. Um, and then the same thing with fishing, just the men who've made space for female fishermen and the guys who are working to keep those options open, even though it's easier to avoid it. Um, and yeah, just like I already said, for the women that came before me with fishing, it, I don't think it'd be really hard to, to jump into something like that if there weren't so many great examples of how great how great a job women could do at anything but commercial fishing. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the questions that we didn't get to was that about how are you inspired, how do you stay inspired? Um, and there's lots, you know, there's lots of factors that go into that, but I definitely am very conscious these days of like the younger generation, some of whom are in this room, um, who really do think what I'm, like they're vocal about when I do something that they think is good, which is really nice and not traditional uh, in my world. So um, it's really nice and it makes me want to make it better for them than it was for me. For some of the struggles that I had, I don't want other people to have to have those. And uh, I wanted to say thank you to Angie, who is going to come back and uh, share with us some information, but Angie's put in so much work um, organizing, thinking really, I think, deeply about what what might stick to you. And look, you're all still here at 720 on a beautiful day. So thank you for being here. Yeah. Um, just a couple closing remarks. Sorry, I need my notes. Sorry, I get forgetful. Um, I want to thank you ladies all so, so much. I don't, I mean, I think I speak for the whole room when I say I'm so inspired and I feel a lot of validation too which I didn't expect and I'm really super thankful for all of you and all of your voices and uh, hopefully we will stay connected after this <laughs> um, and thank you Sarah too for doing such a great job facilitating thank you guys all like Sarah said for staying on such a nice day I'm really pleased uh, that everyone got to show up and ask their questions and um, if you want to connect with anyone afterwards please let me know and I'll make it happen um, I want to say before you all go out, you all received a post survey, so please let us know how we did. Um, not how they did, how I did, <laughs> putting this together. They all did wonderfully. Uh, and there's a box in the, on that table that you can just drop that in. Um, I wanted to plug a couple other events. Sarah, sorry I'm standing in front of her, but Sarah is um, also going to be leading a one hour workshop tomorrow. Um, on mentoring females, whether they're students, peers, uh, co-workers, and that will be 1 to 2 p.m. at the university. Um, so room 230 at the university, you know, empowering and mentoring other females. Uh, you do not have to be a woman to go. Men also work with females and with uh, female students. Um, so you're all welcome to that. Uh, this um, panel discussion is part of a monthly series, a career development series that's hosted by the Complete to Compete grant through the university. The next workshop will be the last Wednesday of June, June 26th, and that will be on social media. So be posted, look for those signs when they go up. Um, and the SICA <laughs> Health Needs and Human Services Commission so graciously put off their meeting until seven, and it's in room one, and they're talking about affordability solutions. So if you want to go, stop in there and um, put your voice in. That would be great to show support for them. Um, 
grab some food on your way out, we'll grab a salad shaker. I think that was everything, and thank you guys again so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.